All right, so welcome everybody to our Talents and Development webinar series. This is D Brown Consulting, sponsors of this series. And this is our September episode, which we're going to talk about personality testing and training effectiveness. So our guest speaker, and it depends if you can get through, she's Juliana Esesobo. She's the head and group of group human resources at Honeywell Group. And she has a lot of experience in HR and L and B and also working in consulting firms. And so she has a very vast and wide experience, uh, experience set. And she'll be sharing her experience with us and also telling us a little bit about her career when she connects. So we could just say, just like this is a wireless, this is um, an online connection. So we could say she's in traffic, on, online traffic right now. So hopefully connect with us to talk about her experience. I wonder how many L&D people we have in the audience. But anyway, today we'll be talking about personality testing and training effectiveness. So we'll do an intro. We review the different popular personality types out there, why we need to use them, the business chemistry methodology, uh, which is the new personality type by Deloitte, which is personality type testing and, and methodology of using and understanding personality types by Deloitte is really, really, really good. So I want to kind of spend quite a bit of time on that, talking about how, why it stands out in our opinion and how you can use it for business and also facilitation. And then we talk about the C-suite and how they can use the personality type. C-suite being your chiefs, your chief executive officer, chief financial officer, CEO, and how they use personality types. Yeah. So, what what exactly is personality? Yeah? I mean, if I check the dictionary, uh, I just checked the dictionary and what it said was the combination of characteristics or qualities that uh, form an individual's distinct character. So that's what a personality is. So this is the dictionary definition I got. Oh, well, this American Psychological Association. Uh, personality refers to the individual differences in characteristics, uh, characteristic patterns, of thinking, feeling, and behavior. Hmm. Sounds very textbook, textbookish. So what are the different personality types that we have? Well, different people have come up with different models. So what I'll do is I'll just look at some popular ones and then go to the one we want to concentrate on for this webinar. So popular personality types, what are they? Well, there is the four temperament theory. I don't know if you've heard of that one. The four temperament theory. It always seems to be four. Most of the theories I've checked have four boxes. And, and I'm one of the advocates that nearly everything in the world can be explained with four boxes. <laughs> so the four temperament theory is um, suggests that there are four fundamental personality types. I think many people know it as the sanguine, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it well, uh, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic or something, <laughs> uh, yeah, if I remember. This was, uh, I used this quite a long time ago. So this is the metric. This is how it looks. You have certain uh, certain personality types exhibiting strong emotions, some uh, unchangeable temperaments, and then changeable temperaments, and then weak emotions. So between, there's like a scale, really, between weak emotions, strong emotions, and then whether or not people can change their ways, right? So um, if you check choleric, I guess, means excitable, eg egocentric, I mean, egocentric, uh, active. Those are choleric. Sanguine is more carefree. Uh, phlegmatic is more controlled, principled. And then you have the melancholic, which is really unhappy, miserable, always, always kind of miserable, I guess. <laughs> Strong emotions, but can't change. I wonder who, who that is. Do you know anyone that exhibits these um, traits? Anyone in particular? Uh, wh what do you think you are in these traits? Are you melancholic? Are you choleric? Are you phlegmatic? Are you sanguine? Which one do you think you are? So these are the different personality types for the four temperament theory. That's what they say we are. Okay, let's say another theory. Let's check something else. Let's see. There's the popular one, Myers-Briggs. It's a... a, a a daughter-mother combination that kind of created this, which has been very, very, very popular, uh, an introspective self-report, right? So you do a self-reporting 
using filling out a questionnaire as to what your uh, psychological preferences are. Yeah, and so that this is this is quite popular. I think the the lady is Catherine, um, uh, Catherine. But actually, the actual theory itself came from one guy called Carl Carl Jung or something. Jung as in J U J U N G. I got that from Wikipedia. If you check it out, you see the history of how this test was formed. But this test has, I think, six or the eight personality or eight um, personality type key. So it's quite complex. I mean, if you look at the key here, it has, um, you have the extroverts, the introverts, you have the sensors, you have the intuitives, you have the judges, the perceivers, the thinkers, and the feelers. Oh, it's quite a mouthful. Can you guys just look through this and tell me which one you think you are? I don't know if anyone has done this test. Where do you think you fit? I, I, for one, I think I'm in between extrovert and introvert. I'm definitely not an extrovert. And I'm more introverted, but I think from the role I play, I have to be in between introvert and extrovert, really. Uh, but I prefer to be an introvert. Now, the funny thing about personality types is, is I think people perceive you more than you perceive yourself. Anyway, so yeah, I think people kind of are better judges of your character, better judges of your personality than you are. So I, I think that. So that's Myers Briggs. There's another interesting one, uh, Belbin. I think Belbin. The theory here is that it, it believes that each each of us uh, possesses a pattern, really a pattern of behavior that characterizes one person's behavior in relation to another in facilitating the pro, uh, process or progress of a team. So when you're working in a team, um, it, it, it's more like a team uh, when you look at people, how, how they work in a team. So there are these patterns of behavior that uh, they tend to exhibit um, in relation to another or uh, in facilitating the progress of teams. So it's a Meredith Belbin that discovered the doctor Meredith Belbin. Uh, so defines team roles in that uh, sense, Belbin. Let me just show you the structure of what it looks like. Uh, this is, again, it looks very complex. Uh, this is what it looks like. So uh, it's just trying to test the tendency of how we behave or how we contribute or how we interrelate with others in a particular way, especially when it comes to teams. So you have the plants, the monitor, the evaluator, uh, PL, create, uh, when in a team you're creative, you're imaginative, you're free thinking, generate ideas and solves hard problems. And the weakness here is ignores incidentals, too preoccupied to fully communicate. Hmm. Sounds complex. So that's PL, there's M E S P S H I M P. So there's the thinking, the action, and then the people side of things. So under teamwork, for example, you're saying, cooperative, per, uh, perceptive, and diplomatic, uh, listens and averts friction. So that's TW. So again, it's like a whole mapping thing, and then you need to map yourself. It's, it's not that easy. Um, but this is the Belbin approach, right? So moving on. Well, there's another one. There's the Firo B. And Firo standing for uh, Fundamental Interpersonal Relations Orientation. Very interesting. Firo, Fundamental Interpersonal Relations Orientation. Uh, B being behavior. I don't know if there's other um, things apart from B, but Fundamental Interpersonal Relations Orientation Behavior. Wow. <laughs> So they say that this can help um, repair broken relationships, this FIRO model. <laughs> so if you're in any broken relationship, you should kind of use that to try and help you out. And it can also take very good relationships to the higher level. So interesting model. Let me show you what it looks like. So this is the structure of the model. You have the inclusion, control, and affection at the top. Those are the needs. And then you have the behaviors coming down from top to bottom down to the left, where you have your expressed and wanted. So expressed and wanted behavior against your needs, which are inclusion, control, and affection. Those are the needs you have. And um, that's how the model is uh, built. So 
again, a lot of analytical, lots of analysis and stuff. Now, where we are going with this uh, uh, webinar is we need something that we can use today, something that we can use while at work, and we can understand people's personality almost instantly and have an idea about how can I work effectively with this person in this team. I need to work with different people in different, uh, there are different personality types in my team. If I can identify the major traits without having to go and read a book, without having to go through too much, that way I'll be able to contribute much more effectively. Uh, so that's what we're talking about in, in this webinar. But these other models are good, but they're more introspective. But let's see. Let's move on. Then we have the disk. Quite a few people here um, did the disk, which is quite nice. I really like the disk uh, methodology or the disk theory. Uh, it's a method uh, basically of identifying predictable actions and personality traits within the human behavior. There's someone called, I think he's a lawyer, if I'm not mistaken, it was a lawyer, Marston. I think he was, he's a lawyer. Uh, so he narrowed down uh, predictable personality traits into four four boxes. Everybody, this is Juliana. I don't know if I can jump straight to your... I'm going to jump many slides back to you and I'll come back to disk. Yeah, okay. so everyone, uh, I'm glad to introduce uh, my co-host. She abandoned me, but she didn't. Juliana. <laughs> <laughs> so Juliana, welcome. Thank you. About L and D and HR related things that can help us be better. So mm -hmm. today is about personality types and training effectiveness. So if you can introduce yourself to us and just tell us, it shows very briefly about your career. Okay. Thank you, David. And my apologies. As you said, I was caught in, um, what is it? Traffic. Not the yeah. typical Ele one. Electronic yeah. traffic. Yes. Electronic yeah. traffic. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I'm Juliana Isesabo, as David has already um, informed you. Um, I am so many things. Um, I'm an HR practitioner. I'm a business practitioner. I'm a strategy practitioner. Um, however, my core is HR. I've been in HR for 18 years, 10 of which were spent in the consulting space, and I've been opportune to provide consulting support to quite a number of entities across both private and public sector. I've been involved across spectrums of activities within HR from transformation to change initiatives to re-engineering initiative. Um, I've been involved in quite a few as a consultant and even in my current role. And also to quickly put in that I've also been uh, a beneficiary of uh, a number of psychometric tools and I've also administered quite a few to other people. And I find them, you know, interesting, uh, not accurate, but quite interesting. Um, I think for me is about 75% um, accuracy that I apply to it. Um, so that's it about just for coming in late. Okay, okay. And and so you were in HR for 18 years. So that means you already knew you wanted HR right from the start, right? Am I right? Um, so I studied chemical engineering. I wouldn't say what? I knew I wanted it. Chemical engineering, I okay. <laughs> on that route. But for me, the turning point came in my fourth year um, in the during the mandatory internship scheme. It occurred to me that if I couldn't go onto the field and be a hardcore engineer, then maybe I could do something else. And I felt drawn to working in the people space. Mm, interesting. Interesting. So how's your career been? 18 years, you've seen so much. And can you tell me the highest high and the lowest low? Can you just pick one of those two extremes? Uh, give us a story around that. <laughs> Okay, so I, I tend not to operate in extremes, so it's a bit difficult to say ISI and lowest so, and 18 years is a long time, so many things, so much water under the bridge. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, if I were to describe that wow moment, uh, my Eureka moment, it's um, the instances where I have been able to develop new product, product lines or to come up with new innovation that has changed the way we approach um, HR in my life as a consultant, even now as a, you know, core practitioner. So it's being able to identify critical issues that are 
you know, providing long-term and sustainable support and solution to, you know, issues that is impacting not just the business, but the individuals. And I've had quite a number of them from my life as a consultant and even now as a core practitioner. For me, it's being able to, to do that. Now, mm-hmm. the times that have not been as palatable, um, the thing about HR is striking a balance between the business and people. And sometimes they are always extremes. The business wants to go in a particular direction. The people part is wants to go in a particular direction. And you need to look for a balance that makes sense for all parties. Sometimes that does not always go right. Um, I'm one everybody happy, but there are instances where you need to take certain decisions. And you know, there'll be winners. There'll be people who will not necessarily win. And so mm-hmm. those times are times that I don't really like because mm-hmm. you know, it takes a lot of emotional so that's okay so really, can i mm-hmm. could i say that let's say like you have to lay someone off i mean it just has to be something that has to be done is that one of those low periods that you know it just has to be done and that's how uh, one of those things in your role that may have so much high emotions but needs to be yeah. done absolutely that would be one of them Mm. And and then for the highs, you mentioned okay, developing something. Could you could you share with us? Maybe not uh, giving us what company if there's any confidential uh-huh. stuff, but just in general, what was those that thing you developed that you were like, wow, this is cool, and it really impacted on the organization. Okay, so um, I think in the years that we had the banking consolidation, um, we had several projects that had to do with integration. And we needed to find the best means of assessing the competences. You know, you had different entities coming together. You had the dominant entity. You had the entity that was being acquired. We needed to mold this organization into one. And it had Mm -hmm. impact on policies, on procedures. It had impact on even how you pay, what you pay, what functions you are going to keep, who you're going to keep into that function. And we needed to look for a way to find the best crop of people, not just saying that I'm taking the dominant position because I'm the acquirer. So automatically my people get the best deal and you know I just plug in the other people. And it was my responsibility to, to design that process. And I was okay. able to design it. The process was trademarked and patented. And, you know, it's generated significant um, credibility for the firm till today. It's generated significant money. But more importantly was the fact that we could export that methodology outside of Nigeria. Um, We had the firm in Ghana that had to do something like that, and they came to us. And, you know, I still look back several years down the line, and it's something I'm extremely proud of because was being able to identify a sustainable um, solution to a problem that is real and and, and ongoing. And that methodology is what most organizations can apply, even when you're not in an M&A situation where you want to have a sense of what are the capabilities of your people, what are the gaps, Mm -hmm. and what can I do. It's it's it's, it's a framework that you can apply even to today. It's relevant even for leadership development, even for um, graduate IR and stuff like that. So that's a particular thing that I'm really, really... Yes, happy about. Mm, nice, nice, nice to hear. And then uh, we're talking about frameworks today. We're talking about personality types and personality frameworks. So if we can get a framework that is very effective that can actually tell us about certain personalities, we'll be able to at least help un- understand how others behave and how others feel, so we can adjust our own behavior and the way we actually interact in teams, so that we can be more productive. So that's what we're talking about today. I don't know if you could say anything more about those personalities and how those, what, what, what methodologies do you currently use, for example, in your, where you work? And are there some new, new, new ideas that you can share, you can share with us? We've talked about the Firo B model. We've talked about one called Belbin. We've talked about the popular Myers Briggs. Now we're talking about DISC. So is there something you could share with us about personality types? Okay, thank you, David. So, um, incidentally, uh, personality tools or personality assessments actually form part of the framework that I developed. Uh, because what we try to do is um, to marry the capabilities, the technical capabilities of the individuals with an understanding of their behaviors and also to ensure there's an alignment with what is required by the organization. 
So it's a scientific tool that you want to leverage because it's not a feeling, I know this person, this is the way this person is. You need to have a science behind it and that's what the personality to provide for you. And I've used quite a few, so I've used this. Um, I recall that there was a project, an M&A situation where you had two joining parties and they had asked us back then to come and administer this and another two. Now, mm -hmm. one of the two was looking at it from the viewpoint of... Um, uh, was the word now aptitude? Why this was okay. looking at it more from personalities and behaviors, and we're able to marry the two to get a sense of the individuals. And they used it to fit people into teams. They used mm -hmm. it to find what departments these people are likely to be more um, effective um, at. Um, mm -hmm. And it was interesting because one of what happened before we we're able to administer was that we had to take the, this test. So you can't. I think it comes from the to school of thought that you can't administer what you don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I found this in particular to be useful uh, because at the end of the way, when you look at the personality tools, they're looking at extremes of how introverted or extroverted you are and yeah. to what extent and people are important. So for me, they are the same in some form. Maybe the way the results or the outcomes are presented are different. The use to which you can put them may also be different. So it's understanding um, the distinguishing factors within those, you know, different tools. I find Gobin in particular extremely useful because in a situation where you need to identify people for teams and when you have a change situation where you have people coming mm -hmm. in or leaving teams, um, for them to be effective, it's good for you to have um, a proportion of the different team types because they have their contribution, they have a value, a plant mm -hmm. is important, mm -hmm. a resource um, investigator is, port is important, a computer yes. finisher is important. I, I found it extremely even important when I had to do my MBM and my MSc. And I realized that those are real. If you get it wrong, if you put too much of a particular type of individual, type. Mm -hmm. you, know, mm -hmm. you will not get work done. I and agree, hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so and so the discs that we're looking at here. I mean, there's more behavior, and and disc is very popular. I mean, and is really good as you mentioned. Belbin, all of them have their, uh, all of them have uh, their pluses, their minuses, but together they're usually very powerful. So what what I see and what I want to introduce next is really a testing. Not really a testing. It's more like understanding people's personality in the workplace and being able to adapt and, and, and use that knowledge to be more effective in teams and then be more productive. So personality types learning. So usually it's, it's, um, you're, you're in a meeting and then you want to basically get the job done. You're an executive. You walk into the meeting and spit in to resolve a certain situation. And then someone else is saying, Oh, sorry, we need to go back and look at uh, the, the data is not accurate. It's not as accurate as it can be. I mean, you, you don't need it to be 100% accurate, but someone else is like, No, 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 no. We need to get it very accurate. Another person is like, Oh, I think that there's another methodology we could use. Everybody bring in all their own different ways of thinking. Oh into the meeting and then you are pre kind of getting more emotional and a bit more pissed pissed off but you don't know that that's just their personality coming in so really what i'm introducing next is the business chemistry is more like it's not i won't call it a personality type thing it's something developed by deloitte who basically said that they need we need we need a system that we can deploy right now that isn't perfect but will give us a far better result now allowing our teams to work more coherently uh, because they have better business chemistry so they have they broken it down into the pioneer the driver the guardian and the integrator and what i'm going to do next for everybody is deloitte created a nice fun video to try and explain these personalities and how they come together in work. So I'm going to play a video for all of us and let's watch this video and then we're going to discuss it throughout and that's with the, we'll discuss everything around it and see where we actually fall as personality types. Uh, so just watch this video. Why business chemistry? Why does it really stand out in my opinion? So most of the other methodologies we've seen are and not kind of is, is, is introspective. So yeah, you're thinking about it yourself. Okay. What am I? And, and it's introspective, but this one is more interaction is this interaction and introspective. So you're like, um, uh, in, it's, it's not, it doesn't depend on you really. You can see 
the traits in others and identify whether or not someone is a pioneer driver, integrator, or guardian. So I'll look through, we'll look through other advantages here is if you go and check it out on the business chemistry, you see that it's rooted in a, a lot of science. It did so much research, so taking all the other personality types. Myers-Briggs, for example, is so such an old personality type that they, they couldn't really test as deeply then. It's all paper and pencil. But now we, we have the internet. We have so many means of testing electronically that we could test 100,000 people and get so much data we can use to now really nail down or kind of pinpoint certain personality types and uh, see how we can work effectively with them. So, and is, again, another key thing about business chemistry is design for business. So that's the, their main aim was to design something for business that we could use today and, and leverage off uh, what's the, all the research that they've done in our day-to-day -day work. So, yeah, so that's one of the advantage. Another one is... It's very simple to apply. It's a very simple uh, methodology to apply and in a really sophisticated system where um, people's personalities and personality clashes, as they say, <laughs> you could try and avoid that when you're, re when you're working. So the system kind of draws on complex algorithms to assess behavior and preferences, but, but then it translates those results into easy to learn patterns. That's the most important thing that are simple to remember and apply. Like I, I can't remember what my, uh, that's for, is it, am I an EN? TP or, or what? I mean, you can't really remember that. You can't start thinking about that in a meeting and saying, is this guy mm -hmm. an EMTP or is a, uh, I mean, the meeting is probably already over before you, <laughs> before you know what this guy exhibits. Yeah. So or Ju <laughs> Juliana, do you, do you agree? Hello. Hello. Are you there? Yeah. I was just yeah. wondering what you think about, uh, about that. Yeah, I, it's quite true. Um, as I listen to you, I try to remember where I fell. I think I I know, but I can't. It's not something I can you know pick just like that. Yeah, yeah. So it could be in between one or two. You will not be hundred percent one. I don't think. I don't think anyone uh, is really hundred percent one personality type, so to say. Do you get? So um, yeah, I, I think I think I think that's true. So. Well, let, let's move on. What I want to do is I'll check the last uh, key distinguishing factor, and then I'll try and play the video again. So personalized individuals and team insight. So it kind of gives you a better feeling about how we work as teams. So business chemistry sheds light on the general team dynamic. And I think there's something you mentioned, Julia, Juliana, when you said that you should bring different personality types into one team. You shouldn't just have one you lose a lot by just having one personality type in a team. So organizations need to look and have a good mix. Uh, and by having that team dynamics, you basically highlight the unique aspects of each individual while also considering the composition of the group in, uh, as a whole. So and I, I do I like an analysis of, of team's composition, provide pers which will actually help you provide perspective on on uh, relative strengths and the area of misalignment and stuff like that. So it's, it helps because it's fast. It's not perfect, but it's, it's fast. So let's see if I can play this video now. And it's a fun video that kind of summarizes the whole thing. So I'll try and play it one more time. If not, then we'll move. I see my team around this table. So much to give, but they're not able. If there could be better chemistry, then together we... We're trying to work here. Where are the facts? It's all fluff, it's all feeling. Let's triple check and perfect. Are you kidding? Here's an idea. That's not clear. It's all theory. So many sides can't decide. Let's take a chance. Not a chance. Run the numbers. Can't we agree? We can see. What a bummer. What if we... Stop wasting time. A brainstorm. Just perform. Let's take turns. Yeah. So, 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 check everything twice, go mix it up. 
All right, so Elements of Business Chemistry, as you saw, is Pioneer, Driver, Integrator, and Guardian. Pioneer, Driver, Integrator, and Guardian. So who is the Pioneer? Right? So the Pioneer can be recognized. Well, if you want a short form of explaining who the Pioneer is, it's simply someone who seeks possibilities. That's the Pioneer. You seek possibilities. They speak, uh, they, they kind of spark uh, energy and imagination within an organization. So they seek possibilities. And let me use seek as a way to explain. So I'll jump straight to the driver. Who is the driver? Someone that seeks challenges. Okay. That's a driver. Someone that really seeks challenges is a driver. Then who is a guardian? Someone that seeks stability. That's a guardian. He, he prefers things to be stable. He's a guardian. So I'll still come back to the more detail. We'll have a nice chat around it. But then who is the integrator? So integrator is someone that seeks connection. So you have someone that seeks connection. Most times he seeks connection. is an integrator. The one that seeks um, stability is a guardian. The one that seeks for driver, the one that seeks a challenge is a driver. You really like challenges. You seek challenges. And the one that seeks um, possibilities is a pioneer. So I've just given you very short definitions of each one. So tell me who you are. Who do you think you are? Do you predominantly seek possibilities as a pioneer? Do you predominantly seek challenges as a driver? Or you prefer connections? So obviously, if you are an introvert, you're not the connection type. <laughs> so you're already <laughs> the extrovert. So me, I think I'm an introvert. So I'm not mm -hmm. the integrator type, unfortunately. I may still have a little bit of it, yes, but it's not my dominant type. And then guardian is stability. I definitely am not a guardian because I, I mean, I prefer risk. I'm a massive high risk taker. So I'm definitely not the one that's just stick stability. Although, uh, so I think I'm more pioneer driver. That's what I think I am, pioneer driver. So, so let me say, and again, as I said, the pioneer is the person, the type that seeks uh, possibilities. So training a pioneer, what insights can we have from actually being a facilitator and you're training a group of pioneers. So anyway, pioneers, they, they love, uh, as we said, they are what? They seek possibilities, right? So they would like you to brainstorm, maybe do a quick, quick brainstorm. Let's seek out some possibilities in, in this brainstorm that we have. So they, I mean, if, if you are uh, working with a pioneer, you, you should kind of bring your A game to the table. So more than anything, pioneers can recognize by their spontaneity and penchant for brainstorming. You easily know that, okay, this guy is, is a pioneer. As, and they are the most really extroverted of the four. Although I still think I have pioneer things with my introverted nature. So, but really they're the most extroverted of the four personality types. And they are quite energetic and expressive and have a broad network and collaborative style. They adapt easily to any changes and they like to jump in and lead, really. So when you see somebody, okay, who wants to lead this? Who, is, who wants to be the prefect? And you see the person's hands up. Okay, that's your pioneer. <laughs> so how do you train such a person? Any, any ideas, Julie, Juliana? Do you, how do you manage such yeah. a person? I think those sort of people want to get things done. They want to be involved. They probably need a lot of engaging activity. They want to be in the middle. 
So you mm-hmm. want to craft a training program that actually helps them to be involved, a training program that is actually quite, um, so there's a lot of dialogue, there's a lot of involvement. It's not lecture, but it's mm-hmm. more maybe workshop type where people are able to share experience, they're able to share their own perspective. Basically, mm-hmm. that's what I would expect because otherwise you would lose them. Um, mm-hmm. They're not very structured in the way they think and they want to take decisions very quickly. So you need to carry them along as much as possible. Mm, yeah, I think so. And uh, But then again, it depends. If you yourself, you are a, maybe you are a guardian as a trainer, you, you, are, you are a guardian and you're training a, a class that has mostly pioneers. Yes. It's, you have to now think, okay, this is my own nature. How do I bring, <laughs> what do I bring to the table to, so that both of us can still work nicely together? Mm-hmm. So it's 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 something that you could look at. Uh, we could look at and see. Okay, understanding that uh, first of all, understanding that they're a pioneer will help us determine how to approach that training, or even forget the training. Even in the teams, how do you approach that team? Yeah. So one key thing is pioneers who have big ideas. Don't be too quick to dismiss those big ideas because that's who they are. They have big big ideas here and there. Don't just dismiss it. Understand that that's where they're coming from, and even if they seem impractical, don't just dismiss it. That's one key thing I'll add to how you manage a pioneer, right? So for a driver, as you said, a driver is more six, what, six challenges. That's what a driver does. It's the type that really, really six challenges. I would say straight away, those are the kind of guys that love quizzes. In a lot of our, our training, we have quizzes and stuff like that. They, they are the ones that are, after they see the results, they were like, what? I didn't get, how come I got eight? I, I must have got nine. Da, 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 da. They're the driver. They're so driven. So you'll be wondering what's wrong with this guy or what's wrong with that lady. And it's just the way they are. The other ones are quiet. I mean, in a class, I've had a, a quiet class where it's a quiet person that got 100%. <laughs> the, the guy that was talking, talking, talking got 70%. But um, you'll be like, oh, look at, she's so quiet and she got 100%. She's quiet, doesn't, it's just her personality. And uh, the driver is just driven by competition and wants to do better. So those are kind of things with drivers. So what about um, the guardian? So again, to, as a reminder, the guardian is the one that seeks stability. That's the core uh, trait for a guardian is seeking stability. So how do you handle or what do you do with a, with a, with a guardian, uh, someone that seeks stability in your class? What are the traits? What do you do? And any, any ideas? Structure is important. Yes, yes. Structure. Concrete facts. Give me proven principles. Yeah. Uh, those are <laughs> those are what's important to a guardian. Yeah, he's very methodical, structure, everything is in, in the right spots and stuff like that. So they are the type that when they come into the class and they see that you didn't the seats are not arranged properly, they would arrange those seats. <laughs> That's the kind of person a guardian is. So they they are also pretty loyal. So very very loyal. Most guardians are. So interesting traits you could bring into the into the classroom, and most likely maybe the uh, timekeeper could be a guardian, right? Just he's going to basically on the right time. You have five minutes left. You have ten minutes left. You have three minutes left. They are the types that would do that. So when, when it comes to process, maybe process-driven yeah, in a team and you want someone to kind of make sure that we follow the process and follow the steps, you have key deliverables. You must have a guardian, a guardian's role. You can put those roles for the guardian to handle. So that's a guardian. What about an integrator? If I remind you, an integrator seeks connection. So he's the type that seeks connections. If you watch the video, you'd have I'd been able to identify those characters who was the integrator character. So they're, they're friendly, they're personable, they're in ways that they're authentically happy with everything and anything, and they look for the happy side in things. So how, when you're doing a training, how do you bring that personality and how do you use that personality in your team effectively? Do you have some integrators in your team, um, Julia? Mm. Not really. Mm. So, Not really. So they, mm, some of the traits is they express uh, emotions and use stories about people to illustrate any facts or analysis. They, they turn it into a story. 
So some um, in five years ago, blah blah blah, they are the storytellers. <laughs> <laughs> they're the storytellers, they're friendly uh, uh, and stuff. So, and they basically bring people together. They integrate. So you, they just come into the room and you know everything, everything is alive because the integrator mm-hmm. is there bringing them, look, let's go for, let, let's, let's go out for drinks and stuff like that. Thank God it's Friday, that kind of thing. So sometimes when there's some hard things that happen in an organization, things are down, you need those integrators to kind of prop people up. So those mm-hmm. personalities to bring people up. So, yeah, integrator. We have a bit of everything, I think, but you would have to identify which one you're strongest on. Uh, 